Hello everyone, and in this lecture, let's continue talking about uh, the rest of the themes. We have governance in Julius Caesar, we do have also uh, fortune, and we have deception as a theme. So I shared with you the PDF file, please follow up with me the uh, discussion about the major themes. So uh, let's start with governance, and as I have already explained to you, uh, in our previous lectures about uh, the monarchy thing and about the republican thing. So, um, governance is considered to be as a major theme in Julius Caesar, explicitly that of Rome, but implicitly that of England. So, whenever we talk about Julius Caesar as a play, uh, there is always um, a connection between Rome and England. And what the whole play is about precisely uh, is considered to be as a subject of a critical debate. So, uh, the so uh, in England uh, in 1599, uh, England was a monarchy during that time, as you remember, student, and uh, people during that time wanted to remove Elizabeth from the throne, and. Uh, the most important thing is that they they wanted to remove Elizabeth, but but at the same time replace her with a different uh, ruler, and um, they will never ever change the uh, government from a monarchy to a republic. Rather, it will stay as it is as a monarchy, but they wanted a different um, leader, king, or whatever. So we can sense that the deep change or the profound change that was to occur was exactly in the middle of the next century with the execution of james's son charles i in 1649. so uh when we talk about shakespearean play and uh, we know that uh the play remained popular with audience right up until the closure of theaters in 1642 and uh, during that time uh, it was actually a civil war if you also do remember this when we talked about uh, the time in which uh, Shakespeare wrote our play Julius Caesar so the play itself might probably seems as a prophetic uh, prophetic which means like predicting something that will happen in a future, especially when it comes to the government part, uh, whether it's going to be a monarchical or a republican. And um, however, no one could have predicted that in a mere 50 years, England would discard centuries of a tradition and find itself a republic. So what it meant here is that no one ever could have predicted that England will be, uh, especially when it comes to the government, will be uh, changing its tradition and become, or let's say, change uh, the government from a monarchy and becomes a republic. So the discussion about the republic or republicanism, so it was a very... Uh, obviously during Shakespearean life and also there is a couple of books here about Republic and the role of Republic and um, a couple of people also connect the Republic to Shakespearean theater and there is also a public discussion about the role of the Parliament so uh, so the matter of changing um, from monarchy to a republic it was actually not a new rather it was also during shakespearean time so um the role of the masses or the role of people is a really considered to be as a theme of uh discussion because uh, tradi uh traditionally the question the play is uh the the question that is important during uh when we uh, talk about our play, the most important question to raise is what do you think, a student, uh, do you think that Rome would be better off as a republic or as a monarchy? And we also 
talking about what is the meaning of republic and what is the meaning of monarchy. So try to distinguish between the two things. So the answer to this question, whether Rome would be a better place for if it were a republic or a monarchy, um, this question cannot be answered exactly uh, within the play because Shakespeare, with no doubt, couldn't uh, find enough time or space to provide any historical background about this whole republic thing. So we have only five acts in the play and Shakespeare didn't provide the audience with any historical background so that they can rely on this background to give a meaningful conclusion, especially about the republic and about the monarchy. So let's come to the historically. We knew that Prudus was a descendant of uh, Lucius Prudus, who was the founder of the Roman Republic. And uh, we do have a lot of information uh, about Prudus, and with no doubt we knew that Prudus was idealized uh, the republic founded by his possible ancestor. Although that republic was in effect of a couple of a state in which the Plippians led truly miserable lives. So for Prudus to have been uh, a true idealist that various critics uh, make him out to be, so he would have had to be uh, ignorant of the personal cruelty of his iconic ancestor and the nature of the republic that he established. So, in fact, the conspirators generally must have had short memories um, because the Roman Republic in the period immediately preceding the time of the play was under the control of Bombay and Scylla. So, uh, both of those two things, uh, reigns, let's say, led people to terror, terror and miserable life. So, uh, we have here a very important thing, student, to discuss, which is, uh, which is uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, the article being uh, written by, uh, as we have here, Philip Goldfarb, and um, his article is continual factions, which means couple of groups or uh, sections. So we do have uh, politics, a friendship, politics, a friendship, and history in Julius Caesar. So this is the name of his article, and in his article he argues and he said something very important. He said that the uh, era of the Roman Republic in which Shakespeare chose to set his play was characterized by the novel uh, centrality of factions with the Prudus and Cassius following Bombay and Scylla, and Caesar, Octavius, Antony, and Lepidius following uh, Marius. So what is he talking about now? So he, uh, Philip in his article, talking about something very important, which is he said that the matter of the Republic and the matter of the monarchy was not there actually in the play, because the focus was on the factions or the focus was on the groups on the friendships of the people because as i have already explained to you there were two groups the good and the bad group right so we have here uh, a centrality of factions which means uh the factions like the groups we have is considered to be as a central theme in our play so uh, he said that the play is by reading less concerned with determining if Rome should become a monarchy or for a rep or a republic, but instead which contending faction will it try. So this is exactly what we are talking about. So the play is not actually concerned if you um, watch uh, or let's say the movie and also. Uh, watch a uh, couple of articles or read, excuse me, a couple of articles, uh, you would probably realize that uh, the most important theme in the play is the factions, like the groups, the good and evil group that 
the army that was there by the end of the battle. We have the good people, and on the other side, we have the bad people. So the play, uh, we cannot actually sense there's any talk about monarchy or republic thing, right? We do have a couple of um, groups, and the play is concerned with which one of the groups or the factions will um, make the victory. So that's the most important thing in our play. And the incredible power of factions under Elizabeth's government make this interpretation appealing on a number of levels. So, which means there is also a connection between the factions in our play and the faction in Elizabethan time. So, ultimately, however, whether this political unit is a faction, a republic, or a monarchy, one can find a parallel in Elizabethan uh, England. So, as I have already said, the play is connected with Elizabethan time or England during that time. Uh, whenever we want to read something in the play, there is a parallel uh, thing that is connected to Elizabeth. It doesn't matter whether this, whether this thing is about a monarchy or a republic or uh, about the factions. Uh, it's there. The connection is there. And we have, you know, the variety of interpretations suggest that the moral ambiguity Shakespeare has introduced to his source material is not deliberate but essential. So Shakespeare um, didn't actually make this ambiguity uh, deliberately, rather it was considered to be as an essential part of our uh, play. So uh, let's come to the uh, second theme which is fortune. So, unfortunately, we have the prevalence of omens, prophecies in Julius Caesar uh, signifies a very important thing, which is the fortune and the relative powerlessness of men in human affairs. So, despite Calpurnia's, uh, let's say, great effort, efforts in, um, you know, in changing, or let's say also, in changing Caesar's mind and um, despite her offers to keep him home, uh, her, her, you know, because she had dreamt about Caesar, so her dream came true no matter what she did to stop him from uh, going to the capital the next day. And also for Prudus, especially Prudus' desire to, desire to prevent Rome from becoming a monarchy, it is in his involvement in the assassination that ultimately brings about the role of Octavius. So, we have a Prudus who wanted actually uh, Rome to be uh, a republic, but rather he make it himself a monarchy because he killed Caesar and then we do have an assessor uh, after Caesar, his name is Octavius, who's going to be ruling after Caesar. So, he couldn't actually change the future. He couldn't, uh, because these things are meant to happen, so that's why it happened. Uh, and if you also do remember a student about fate, and we said whether we can uh, control our fate or whether we can control our uh, future. So, in both of, like, Calpurnia and uh, Prudus, both of them couldn't actually change the future because uh, killing Caesar is going to happen no matter what they did. And Prudus also uh, a desire to make Rome as a republic uh, was also felt because he made it himself a monarchy. So, do you see this is student? So, uh, Prudus, the intellectual... Uh, does not understand the nature of history and human inability to control future events. So, Prudus, as a, a great character, he should also uh, remember that a human being cannot actually control a future and change a future. So, we actually see 
a couple of the same uh, things happen in a lot of Shakespearean plays, especially in the histories and the tragedies, uh, such as uh, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, we have also in uh, we also have in uh, Iago in uh, Othello, and so is in Macbeth and Richard the Third. So. Uh, the idea that one can manage the future in, in in manage the future is in itself a form of a hubris. So this is like the whole idea about changing the future is kind of like uh, only connected to those who have ego or they think themselves that they can control everything. So this whole idea cannot a student work actually with normal people. Only those people who have uh, hubris, or let's say ego, they believe that they can change the future. And it is obviously not limited to those with bad intention. Um, and Shakespeare normally relate this, you know, controlling the future, normally Shakespeare relate it and consider it as a characteristics of a human nature. So, Yes, of course, it is considered to be as a characteristic of human nature because we all want it to change our future, but it's already there, it's already been written, and um, we cannot actually change it. Uh, after all, people like to believe they are always in control, but they are not always in control in real life or in Shakespeare's plays. So... Uh, so, in as much as change is the only known constant, the vagaries, or let's say the illusion of fortune and power, are inevitable con conditions of a human uh, experience. So, these things like the illusions and thinking like you are in a power is considered something inescapable and it's related to human experience. And uh, all of these things are considered to be the heart of the Greek tragedy. And Shakespeare uh, incorporates them in his tragedies and in his histories as well. So uh, we have in uh, 44 uh, BC, Julius Caesar held absolute, held absolute uh, power in Rome in all but name. So there is actually an irony in the day that Caesar was called because at the same day that at the same day that Caesar was called was supposed to be proclaimed a king. So this considered to be as an irony and the irony here is intensified by the knowledge that he had narrowly escaped death on more than one occasion in his militarily campaigns. So, uh, how can I make it clear for you? So, a student, uh, Caesar was truly self-assured that nothing will happen to him, right? And um, if he not was, if he was not actually assured, then he could have escaped assassination. So he had that kind of ego within himself self pride or making himself thinking like he's a godlike figure and uh, we do also have Artemidarus who said to him it was holding a letter and he said Caesar if you read this then you may probably live and if you not then the fates and we come to the fate student in relation to the future the fates with uh, traitors do contrive interfere and which means you're gonna die so uh shakespeare relies on the audience's knowledge that caesar's death is inevitable which means something cannot be escaped inescapable even as he highlights the occasion on which it it might have been prevented so, student, when we were talking about Caesar's death and we said that can Caesar, if he truly listened to Artemidarus and the soothsayer, would he escape his death? 
then here kind of like there's an answer no because such a thing is inevitable such a thing is gonna happen no matter how he uh wanted to change it right so this is all about the fortune student and then uh, let's go to the other theme which is deception so deception whether it's going to be a self-deception and let's focus on this self-deception or deception by others is essential in uh, shakespearean tragedy so uh we have caesar and we said that caesar was easily deceived by his vanity and also we have and also we have uh, each one of the characters in the play uh with the exception of the soothsayer Artemid Darius, who possesses supernatural wisdom, is deceived by the conspirators, even Antony. We have California to uh, got the sense that something is um, gonna happen to her prophetic dream. Cesaro and the other might suspect something uh, untoward, but Shakespeare does not pursue their possible suspicion. So the senses in the play that most clearly demonstrate the scenes story uh, in the play that demonstrate the this deception part is Act 2, Scene 2, when the conspirators come to Caesar's house to escort him to his death. So we have here the deception, number one. And in Act 3, Scene 1, when Antony appears before the conspirators in uh as if he was one of his, one of uh, as if he was kind of like a friend to them so we have here another deception and uh you might probably be very shocked because we um we think that like or let's say the writer also thinks that uh, the prevailing opinion about Prudus Prudus is considered to be as a masterful deceiver so though he's a nobleman but he's a masterful deceiver in many parts so before the uh conspirators come to his house he soliloquizes a couple of words within himself so uh he said conspiracy hide it in the smiles and affability which means we're gonna hide the conspiracy with a smile so he now he's also considered to be one of the uh, master deceivers and also after they plan uh, and after the conspirators left his house he said good gentlemen look fresh and merrily let not our looks put on our purposes what he means by that try not to show on your faces that we are planning against caesar uh, try to look very friendly try to smile try to act as if nothing gonna happen so we do have Prudus as a masterful deceiver and these lines are similar to lady macbeth if if you ever read macbeth and we can sense and we can uh say that Prudus is a master of self-deception as well so uh he can um, he can call the conspirators sacrificers but not butchers and we know that uh, he finds no evidence that Caesar will govern badly as we have said uh, they said he was ambitious but he didn't have a clue right and yet he persuaded himself that Caesar is like a serpent egg that must be crushed and he is convinced by Antony that he is harmless. So student, he also is convinced that Antony is harmless, but Antony deceived him. So we do have a lot of deception in our play. And as I have said, that Prudus is considered to be the master of deception. So... Uh, in sum, let's come to the conclusion. Uh, in uh, in um, in our play, uh, our play somehow resembles 
or all Shakespearean self-assured tragic heroes of plays such as Macbeth and Carolanius as well so whether the question is about governance or whether the question about fortune or deception there are hundreds and hundreds of themes about uh, our play Julius Caesar and when we talk about each single theme then we can relate it directly to the characters so i hope uh, our lecture is clear student and um, thank you for listening